Hello, everyone. Bruce Bjornstad here. On March 4th, 2020, just before the pandemic hit, the world unexpectedly lost Tom Foster. He was only 60 years old. He was a friend of mine, an exceptional photographer, and a valuable contributor to the geology of the Pacific Northwest. I'd like to share with you some of Tom's work and my memories of some of our collaborative scientific work we performed together related to the Ice Age floods. Here are some of the memories I have of Tom and our many hikes together in the Channel Scavland of Eastern Washington. Included are photos I took of Tom in his element and some photos that Tom took of me. Also included are video clips of some of the areas we studied and visited together, which I took later with a drone. Here are some examples of Tom's fine photographs. Tom grew up in Ellensburg, Washington, where his father was an emeritus professor of photography at Central Washington University. Tom apparently learned photography at an early age from his father and became an, an exceptional photographer in his own right. Perhaps Tom is best known for putting together and managing his hugefloods.com website, which featured a lot of his excellent photography. Tom was a hard worker and always put 110% into whatever he did. He had a regular full-time job working as an upper-level manager for Twin City Foods, a major processor of vegetables in Pasco, Washington. While Tom had little formal training in geology, he was obsessed with the subject and had a naturally deep understanding and intuition for both geology and geologic processes. Tom's job in the agricultural industry would sometimes intersect with his geologic interests. For example, he occasionally needed to witness and evaluate the methods for harvesting the many crops that were produced by his employer. Dark gray and black basalt is the only bedrock native to this region. While surveying their croplands, Tom noticed lots of pebbles and cobbles composed of other types of rocks in the fields including very hard, multicolored clasts of argillite and quartzite, like these. Turns out these erratics are derived from old belt rocks, derived from northern Idaho, Montana, or British Columbia, rafted here on icebergs during the Missoula floods. The majority, about 75%, of these ice-rafted erratics in the Pacific Northwest are composed of like colored granite rocks like these. Whenever we came across larger erratics like these, Tom and I independently noted their location, which among other things, provides valuable information on the height and speed of the floodwaters. I learned of Tom through a voluntary study he did for relicensing of hydroelectric dams along the Columbia River in the early 2000s. I was really impressed with his photographs and his understanding of the local geology, especially the Ice Age floods and his hugefloods.com website. Around this time, I was in the process of writing my first On the Trail of the Ice Age Floods guidebook, and I contacted him about possibly meeting and doing some hikes together. He agreed 
And we later met at the McDonald's in downtown Othello on a beautiful spring day. We drove into the nearby Drumheller Channels, parked our cars at the Upper Goose Lake, and started hiking south, going cross-country up and down through a crazy maze of mesas, canyons, and buttes within Drumheller's Columbia National Wildlife Refuge. I've been a lifetime hiker and consider myself strong and adventurous, but soon found myself struggling to keep up with Tom, who just barreled along at an incessant pace and only stopping to take an occasional photograph. Several hours later, we wound up at the base of an amazing island of basalt, rimmed with some of the most spectacular basalt columns we'd ever seen. We walked with interest around the base of the plateau until finding a safe route to the top of this flood streamlined basalt island. We were both blown away by the exposure of the polygonal columns along the high rim on top. Later, Tom introduced Central Washington University geologist Nick Zentner to the columns, who has since reported on the columns on YouTube. This includes the time Nick accidentally dropped his rock hammer down one of the cracks between the columns, while Tom videotaped the entire event. The rock hammer is still missing, despite many efforts to fish it out. While Tom was super confident and strong in his hiking, in his photography, in his computer graphic skills. He was extremely timid, quiet, and unassuming in public or group situations. He intentionally avoided the spotlight, always defaulting to others for the attention. I remember once when our local chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute asked Tom to share his photographs at one of our bi-monthly meetings. Tom agreed, but only if I did the presentation of his photographs. I tried to talk Tom into doing his own presentation, but he insisted that someone else do it. I ended up giving the presentation in his place while he sat in silence at the back of the auditorium. I wasn't angry or upset, but just surprised that someone so talented could be so modest. Tom truly loved sharing his work with the rest of the world, as long as our attention wasn't on him personally. But Tom was definitely in charge and at the top of his game when it came time to capturing beautiful photographic images. or when writing, planning, and editing Nick's earliest videos, or managing his own hugefloods.com website. The longest and most grueling hike we did was a 20-mile trek on a beautiful fall day along the east rim of Upper Grand Coulee. We started the cross-country route at the south end of the Coulee, early in the day and didn't arrive at our shuttle vehicle in Northrop Canyon many hours later as the sun was setting. 
Along the way, we had many wonderful, unobstructed views of iconic Steamball Rock. I recall after one of our longer and more strenuous hikes, I was ready to call it a day and head home. But Tom suggested a quickie hike to the top of Umatilla Rock Blade that extends out in front of Dry Falls. Having never been to the top of Umatilla Rock before, I agreed. This monolith is surrounded and isolated on all sides by vertical basalt cliffs, except in one small spot where one can scramble up the steep tailless slope to access the summit. The uppermost part required some hand-over-hand -hand climbing. Once on top, it was an easy walk across most of the top of the narrow blade of basalt. As the sun set, we stopped many times to soak in the dramatic view and take pictures from this unique an almost inaccessible vantage point. An even longer blade of basalt is the four mile long Great Blade, located above the popular Lenore Caves State Park within the lower Grand Coulee. From the Coulee floor, the Great Blade appears is just a massive wall of basalt along the east side. In reality, the wall is a narrow blade of basalt eroded by two recessional cataracts on either side of the blade, leaving behind only a narrow basalt bench on top on which we walked. Tom tried to innovate new ways of getting unique photographs in order to capture the true size and scale of the mega floods. On one of our hikes to several incredibly huge and deep potholes near Deep Lake, Tom rigged up a complicated system to obtain pictures from above the potholes. In so doing, he mounted his camera atop a long, extendable pole. Once extended, Tom took pictures remotely using a handheld 
shutter release while trying to aim and balance the whole awkward contraption. Here's the result with me photographing him in his pole-mounted camera. Of course, this was cumbersome and required a lot of extra work and effort. Within a few years, we had each purchased our own small and affordable drones, making it much easier and quicker to collect quality aerial images of large-scale flood features like these giant potholes at Deep Lake. The Castle Lake Cataract and Basin is another little-known and rarely visited site at the east end of the Great Cataract Group, opposite Dry Falls. Access into the Castle Lake Basin is a challenge. It can be accessed from below via the upper end of Deep Lake, or as Tom and I accessed it from above, from the direction of Cooley City and the main canal. Going in this direction, one must carefully descend two steel ladders anchored to the wall of the near vertical cataract. Here's Tom descending one of the ladders. Apparently, the ladders were constructed and installed back in the 1950s by men working on the nearby Columbia Basin Irrigation Project. Once in the basin, we explored the flood-carved castle, along with numerous potholes, and rock benches within the basin before descending further down to Deep Lake. Tom loved the Palouse River Canyon, and one of his last projects was to help maintain and retain public access at Palouse Falls State Park. Several years earlier, I invited Tom to join me in an annual early spring hike along the canyon sponsored by the Ice Age Floods Institute. We started at Sacagawea State Park, ending up at Palouse Falls State Park, six miles up the canyon. Note, there was no established trail along the Palouse River Canyon. Our hike was a bushwhack, and a rare and special guided hike offered exclusively to the Ice Age Floods Institute. The route crossed lots of rough and difficult terrain, some of which was on private property, not open to the public. We also teamed up for memorable hikes into Northrop Canyon, into the top of the adjacent Castle Rock, off of the Upper Grand Coulee, One of our last hikes Tom and I did together was to the White Bluffs along the beautiful Columbia River within the Hanford Reach National Monument. Some wonderful sand dunes exist here where west winds erode and blow sand up onto the top of the bluffs from an exposure of mega flood deposited rhythmites below.
Thank you for watching and sharing in the memory of Tom Foster.